and just the gothic at all costs. A reclusive intellectual for whom life holds no joy. Moon prison of power. She's really rude because how can you not be rude working in retail? Come on. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It is Emma and I am here because I bought a lot of books. A lot of you guys have been asking for a quarantine book haul or <laughs> a video where I somehow show you all of the books that I accumulated and either had gifted to me, which was just so amazing and I can't thank you guys enough and all the people who sent me books while I was um, staying with my family uh, for the time that I was there. But now I am back here. I'm obviously still quarantined, not really going anywhere. But during that time of about probably over three months, maybe almost four months now, I did accumulate a lot of books that you can't really see because it's a very big stack. So I just thought I would go over each of them, kind of explain the synopsis and the plot, if you guys want recommendations or ideas, or if you just want to see how many books I added to my bookshelves this pandemic. Where do I want to start? You know what, let's just start from the top. So the first book I have here is a gift that was very kindly given to me by a subscriber and she just somehow knew that I didn't own this book and that I have wanted to read it for forever um, and she sent it my way and I'm so happy to have this because it, yes. That book is The Monk by Matthew Lewis, the 1796 gothic story set in Madrid at a monastery where the monk in question named Ambrosio basically uh, renounces and relinquishes his vows and descends into this world of immorality and violence and just catastrophic self-destruction and destruction basically in every facet of his life after he starts to not really fall in love, I don't really want to say that because that sounds fun, um, after he starts to have feelings for this very young girl. When this was first published it was just condemned as being this obscene, violent, insane thing that no one um, thought anyone should should be reading but um, on the back it says that Matthew Lewis draws from a lot of folklore and ghost stories and a lot of the violence presented in here is with inspiration from the French Revolution so there's a lot more going on than just a really immoral story at the core of this book. You guys know I love the gothic and dark spooky stories and of course I'm always trying to add to my collection up there. This will be really interesting too because I've read the mysteries of Udolpho and in the preface and introduction of this Matthew Lewis talks about Anne Radcliffe pretty extensively and talks about her mysteries is one of the greatest novels ever basically and kind of inspired him to keep writing his gothic story so that's really interesting too and just the gothic at all costs the gothic at all costs i want that like on a pillow someone always comments every time i show this in a video that the monk was just a wild ride multiple people have described it as a wild crazy ride over and over again and i'm just so ready to get on this roller coaster so, so that is the first book of this little quarantine also, would just like to say that it, we've got a humidex of 41 degrees Celsius this fine day. So, so. One of the most recent books that I bought is actually Pavane for a Dead Princess. Wow, that white belt. By Parkman Yu. Yu? I, I don't know. Um, this is one of the editions from the Library of Korean Literature. This is volume 11. I had no idea these existed until I fell into this hole on Goodreads trying to find some contemporary Korean literature that I wanted to get into and get my hands on because I haven't really delved deeply into a lot of contemporary Korean classics, modern classics, whatever you want to call them. So, Pavane for a Dead Princess sounded extremely interesting because it delves really deeply and kind of jarringly into Korea's contemporary beauty culture and not even super recent contemporary, what does that even mean? Um, this is set during the 80s. And we're following what the author describes as a very attractive man and the ugliest woman of the century. Um, I've read a few pages of this book here and there and I've already like the writing from those first few pages was amazing. I loved it. It gave me a lot of, I don't even know, not Murakami necessarily. I don't know. It was just really good. It's also interesting because flipping through this book as well, I've noticed that a lot or some, almost every page has lines that aren't 
bold like the text has been drained of color to the point where it's not black anymore it's a very dusty light gray um, at first I thought it was just the maybe the printer had messed up or something but um, it looks like it's very intentional so I'm very excited to see what that is about um, I don't know why that happens because obviously I haven't read this book yet but I'm very excited to get into this it seems like it's a really poetic deep study of beauty and fetishism of the <laughs> aesthetic sort so that's really interesting it also gave me kind of phantom of the opera vibes because i know these two people the really nice looking man and the very apparently ugly looking woman are in a relationship with each other so um it gave me definitely some phantom of the opera kind of ugly versus beautiful maybe picture of dorian gray stuff as well so um i'm just really excited to read this this is kind of at the top of my tbr and i would love to get more into these editions because they're so nice um and there's so many good ones on the list that I found but um, I just went with this one because I had to start somewhere so moving for a this next book is a book that arrived yesterday and I just had to open it because um, I guess I'm considering this book kind of the last book in this chronological book accumulation period in my life but um, it's from my favorite person ever. You guys probably know who this is. It was a book of his poetry that I didn't have in its complete forms. I had some of them stashed in between other collections and anthologies of his poems, but I didn't have his full book. So it is The Book of Images by Rilke. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to be holding this. This is also one of the really nice buttery covers. That's like very <laughs> distorted and hard to look at. It's like a migraine print. Rilke wrote this when he was pretty young. It was actually published twice, first in 1902 and then in 1906. Um, it was apparently written during this like seven year period where obviously Stories of God and a lot of other works I talk about all the time came kind of before that. Um, and it's interesting too because a lot of his work is composed super super quickly. Like one of his most famous works, the Domino Elegies, are composed like within an insane um, amount of time being not a lot of time but the book of images apparently took seven years to complete it was after he took a lot of trips to russia he had a lot of complicated relationships which are explored pretty deeply probably in here and in a lot of his collected letters as well so i've never read anything from the book of images i don't maybe i have i probably have i just don't know it but um this is just a book of poetry with the English on one side and the German on the other um, and it's pretty long pretty lengthy it comes with some commentary a pretty good preface and this is translated by Edward Snow who uh, has translated a lot of Rilke's work and has been called probably Rilke's best uh, German to English translator so I'm excited to get into this and I'm so happy to have this in my hands if you don't know you, you know he's my favorite uh, poet so this is here and I will also be using this to uh, create a different video in the future which will be coming hopefully soon. I actually just want to read you guys the little introduction of the description of the way that I think this is Edward Snow describes Rilke because it's really really nice. Um, it calls him the poet of memory, of childhood, of leave taking and looking back the poet of night and its vastnesses, the poet of human separations, the poet of thresholds and silences, of landscapes charged with remoteness and expectancy, the poet especially of solitude in its endless inflections. That's pretty good. Kind of like that. Some of these books that I bought in quarantine didn't really reflect that I was in quarantine. Some of them I obviously just wanted to read. Others I got either for their really light, fluffy value because a lot of bad stuff has obviously been going on, but others I got because of their kind of dystopian, dark, heavy, sometimes apocalyptic function because um, I kind of been flipping back and forth between what the pandemic has done to my reading taste, which is so interesting and so many people have said that they're picking up a lot of dystopian works or works where the world is ending or has ended because it makes them feel better about what's going on or makes them feel a very certain way about this year uh, and that is true of me as well so the next one is a light fluffy read because uh, I needed some of that we probably all needed some of that it is a manga it is a very pure wholesome Komi can't communicate by Tomohito Ada I talked about this a lot in one of my vlogs um, I've heard this recommended a lot I've heard it is just the most <sighs> It's the sweetest thing in the world, apparently. We're in high school and Komi is seen as this hugely popular, intense, legendary, aloof, 
uh, figure and everyone thinks she is the coolest person at school. She stoops to talk to no one. She doesn't speak to anyone. She goes about her day kind of not even looking people in the eye and everyone thinks she is just the coolest person ever. But we very quickly find out that that's not the case. She just has this extreme social anxiety disorder where she can't talk to people, she can't make friends, and people mistake that for aloofness, I guess. Our other character, Tadano, kind of realizes this when he's stuck in a classroom with Komiya on the first day of high school, and then they kind of set out on a journey, a mission to make Komi 100 friends. Anyway, haven't read it yet. Really, really looking forward to it. I am so excited uh, to get into this and just like, I just, uh, I want to make 100 friends too. Anyway, I feel like I'm gonna relate to this so much and love this so much and I can't wait to read this. So, that is Comey Cannot Communicate. Next up, I got a sci-fi that I've been looking at for a little while, um, and that is Solaris by Stanislaw Lem. Uh, actually, while I was staying at my parents, my mom got the chance to read this, and she said it was really good. I still have yet to read it, so I'm really looking forward to this. I know this is the super intense, kind of psychological thriller-ry sci-fi in which we're following astronauts, space explorers, who go to the planet called Solaris, um, and they kind of find out that it's sentient, which is a really cool concept of like this rock that holds sentient beings, such as like Earth or whatever, being sentient in and of itself, and then it kind of has the power to unleash or create, I don't know if they're false memories or actual memories, and the people who are visiting and staying on this island of like past loves they had, or really bad childhood trauma, or like the planet as kind of this malignant evil villain, I think is what's going on in here, so that sounds just Yes. It's also cool too because our main character, Chris Kelvin, Chris Kelvin, that's a real name, uh, he's sent to the planet to kind of explore and study the ocean that covers its surface, but then I guess the intelligence quotient or the intelligence ratio or the study, the direction of study changes and then it becomes like the planet is studying him um, and kind of influencing him and scaring him and probably harming him as well. So I know this has been out for a long time, I believe since the 60s? Yes, 1961. So I'm really excited to see what this holds. It's been a while since I read an adult sci-fi, I believe, and I'm really excited to get back in because I love sci-fi so much. So. That is Solaris. This next book is a book I've been meaning to read for a long time. I absolutely forget where I heard about this from. I heard about it from somewhere. Anyway, it's Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. Um, I really, I only have the slightest idea of what this novel is about, um, and especially for classics or really any kind of literary fiction, I love going in with like no idea of what to expect. Really vague, outliney, ghostly structures of what the synopsis is or the plot because I like not knowing things and not having a lot of ideas about this. I say this all the time. But this book follows Harry Haller, who is a reclusive intellectual for whom life holds no joy. I know that this involves a wolf. I'm not sure if he is a wolf. I'm not sure if he turns into a wolf. I'm not sure if the wolf is just a metaphor. I'm not sure what the wolf is a metaphor for, but I am really intrigued and excited to find out. It sounds on the back vaguely. I know, I know, I don't think this is magical realism. Um, don't tell me anything about it in the comments. I don't want to know. This pandemic, I also got into the Penguin English Library editions of classics and I ordered a few of them. So let me just really quickly go over this one. It is A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. I read Charles Dickens for the first time in quarantine as well, which was a really cool, um, it was a good, it was a good experience. It was one that gave me a lot of comfort and I read Great Expectations. That was the book I read. I loved it. I fell in love. I don't know why I had waited so long in my life to read Charles Dickens because it was in Incredible. His writing gave me so much joy and it's a very it was like a very cozy book even though Great Expectations as well has a lot of creepy and a lot of things going on and drama and romance but I've not read any other of his works so I decided to go for A Tale of Two Cities which I keep saying there's gonna be something coming with this book and I promise you there will be. Also uh, a book that I'm very foggy on the plot line. I know we're kind of bouncing back and forth between the cobblestones, the bloody streets of Paris and London. 
president. And then, in the midst of the chaos, two men, an exiled French aristocrat and a dissolute English lawyer, are both redeemed and condemned by their love for the same woman. This is also a book I would like to read, I mean, probably not in conjunction with because that would be insane, but definitely before, after, very closely after War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, which is right here, because um, if you know, you know. <laughs> Tolstoy was just in love with, I ship, I ship them so hard, he was in love with Dickens, um, and there's so much of obviously a parallel between War and Peace and A Tale of Two Cities, and they deal with war, uh, obviously, and yeah, so that's gonna be really interesting as well, but that's the first one I got was A Tale of Two Cities. Another light, fluffy read I got and that I'm just so happy about, I'm so happy about, is Sailor Moon, Moon Prison of Power. I got volume one by Nako Takuchi because I've just, I've never read it. I've never read, I've never read it. I don't know why. I was obsessed, still am obsessed, watched it so much when I was younger, and now I finally have volume one in my hands. This is actually on my July TBR, hopefully, don't know if I'm going to get to it, but I just really, really really want to get to it. I probably don't really have to say that much about Sailor Moon, but basically uh, we follow Sailor Moon and her friends. Her world changes, I'm not really gonna say anything, but after that they go around kicking names, taking butt. That is incorrect. That is not what they do. Um, but yeah, I'm just really excited to read this and Mwah. This next book was gifted to me by my aunt, and I'm so happy that I have this in my hands. You guys know, also in quarantine, I became obsessed with magical realism. I'd always had a really big interest in it, but during quarantine, I got to read so many works of it and experience it in so many different forms and everything like that. Um, so obviously, I had to get the Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. So, um, this is just an absolutely stunning edition. I believe this is the 50th anniversary Penguin edition, and I love it. It's got deckled edges. Of course, this is another Russian classic. Much later, though, I believe this is 19... 67? 1965, but um, I'm also very interested in the social commentary that's going on in this because this was actually banned in Russia when it was first published. I don't really do five star prediction videos or like new favorite prediction videos, but um, if I did, you can bet all of your bag of buttons that the Master of Margarita would be on that list. I think I am going to just become obsessed with this book, like obsessed and fall into it and love it and read it over and over again and I'm so happy to have this book. So that is this guy. I feel like I've got a pretty good balance going on in quarantine between light, fluffy, sweet, nice reads and death and destruction, the two sides of my personality. So this next book was also sent to me by Rose, one of my subscribers. I love you so much. Thank you for this. I am so happy to have this in my hands. Um, I just, literally every time I hold it, I just want to read it and sit down and um, get into it because this was a book that I read back in January, but I listened to it via audiobook and I just knew that I wanted to have it and read it again with my own eyes and just love it. It's just so quirky, so fun, and it is Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Everyone has probably either heard of it or have you seen the Studio Ghibli movie. This is one of the most charming books I've ever read. That is like the word I use every time I describe this book. It just oozes charm. Um, and it is so cute, sweet, wholesome. Our main girl, Sophie Hatter, works in a hat shop. She's really rude because how can you not be rude working in retail? Come on. It turns out the lady she was really rude to is actually a witch and then the witch curses her um, by turning her body into that of a 90 year old woman. So Sophie, really distraught, really upset, obviously no one recognizes her or knows who she is anymore, goes in search of Howell and his moving castle because Howell is a wizard and she thinks if anyone can cure her, it is Howell. Everyone in Ingri, where this book is set, are they're all terrified of Howell because they think he is this really devious, deceitful wizard, um, but Sophie goes in search of him because she's really not afraid of anything. I just love Sophie so much. While she's there, she basically says, I'm not leaving and I'm going to be your cleaning cooking lady because your castle is a damn mess. Clean yourself up. That is what she says. And then she basically installs herself as one of the elements of Hal's castle in which we find out there are more than a few people and things and demons, spirits, cobwebs, scarecrows, literally everything in here. It's a perfect like middle grade um, spooky Halloween 
book as well, but it's also a middle grade where you feel like it was probably written for adults as well. And I just ah, love it. Love it. This next book is an author I've been meaning to get into for a while, and that is Yukio Mishima, and I got The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea. This is apparently a masterpiece of taut violence taught as in a string, not to teach. <laughs> this tells the story of a love affair between a widow and a naval officer and the effects it has on her son, who basically gets into a lot of trouble and a lot of violence. That's really all I know about it as well. It's also a very short read. Mishima is an author I've been meaning to pick up for a long time, and The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea is one of his most famous works, so um, that is the one I decided to go with. We've got another edition of the Penguin English Library coming in the form of a room with a view by Ian Forster. I bought this because Carolyn from Carolyn Mary Reads really she influenced me to pick this up. I guess all of quarantine as well kind of felt like you were just stuck in a room and I hope you all had a good view but this is a really sweet novel. It's a little bit of romance novel. I've never read Ian Forster um, but it's not really romance romance. It's more about kind of Italy and the country and the romance that our main character Lucy has with the people there and the country itself and um, I know the town or the region or wherever she's staying I feel like that becomes such a personality and a thing as well but while she is there she meets all the people in this. Is it a hotel? Who knows? Uh, it's sun-drenched, optimistic, and it explores many issues at the heart of Edwardian life. Radical thinking, women's suffrage, the constrictions of English social rules, and the makings of a really witty love story. I've seen the movie, never read the book, never got into Ian Forster. It's a pretty short little teeny tiny read, so I'm really um, excited to get into this one. So that is a room with a view. Next we got a book that I own, but I wanted a different copy of it. Uh, the copy I own is a mass market paperback. The print is tinier than like little baby ants on the page and I don't need that eye strain in my life. And also this is a new translation and a new construction of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, this is the one translated by Rolf Humphreys. It is, I think, 10 beat, yes, on rhymed lines of... The Myths. Uh, if you don't know, Ovid's Metamorphoses is a compilation and a collection put together by Ovid, uh, a Roman, obviously in ancient Rome, of the Greek myths of transformation, change, and evolution from one state to another. Uh, I guess kind of an example would be Daphne and Apollo, where Daphne's fleeing from the god Apollo who's chasing her and she turns into a laurel tree. So stuff like that. This copy I plan to annotate, go through, mark up, tab, absolutely everything. I have so much interest in Ovidian everything and also so much influence is taken from Ovid uh, from Shakespeare eh, you kind of know what I mean I've been thinking of doing maybe like a read-along or just kind of hosting something if anyone wanted to join me reading Ovid's Metamorphoses taking it really slowly going over everything in nice equal fun measure that is something I have been toying with because I would love to read this with other people it is such an interesting fascinating piece of work and I can't wait to get into it this next book I managed to finish and read and I gave it five stars and I love it and it's magical realism it's one of my favorite books ever now and it is After Dark by Haruki Murakami. I just... This book makes me so happy every time I think of it. Every time I hold it, I just want to read it again. I had literally one of the best intensive, immersive experiences reading this book because I read this book all during um, the nighttime hours over a period of a few weeks. Each time I would read it, I would put on the soundtrack that this book supplies you with. It's a lot of jazz. Obviously, the title After Dark uh, comes from Five Spot After Dark by Curtis Fuller. It's the one that goes like... Okay, anyway, that, that, that one. Um, and it was so beautiful. This is a work of spooky, nighttime, jazzy, magical realism where people fall in and out of pockets where they can meet each other, talk to each other, enter the world of the nighttime human being, which is a completely different human being from people who are diurnal creatures, and it was just fantastic. I loved it. There's so much going on, so much mystery and creepiness and weirdness and loneliness and whole and it made me so happy. I love this book so much. I'm just 
I feel like so lucky that I got to read it, which is a really weird feeling to have with a book because of course you can pick up a book anytime you would like, but After Dark entered my life at the exact right moment. And kind of like an interesting one too because it's a book that makes you want to flee out into the nighttime and go experience life during the nocturnal hours and talk to people and sit in strange places and go to like 24 hour grocery stores or something like that, which obviously is a sentiment that can't really be acted upon right now. So that was interesting as well, but that is After Dark. Sliding right into our next work of magical realism and collected fiction, which that is the literal title of this work. It is Ficciones or Collected Fiction by Jorge Luis Borges. After I finish After Dark and 100 Years of Solitude especially, which I don't have in this haul because I didn't get it during quarantine, but I read it during quarantine. I've been thinking also of doing a video of everything I read in quarantine, which might be interesting. Anyway, um, this is the work that I decided to go with after hunting around, finding a lot of options. I got Collected Fictions, which is a whole bunch of little collected prose and fictions and stories. The very celebrated Argentine author is the one I decided to go with. I've heard so many good things about this. The main themes that are explored in a lot of these stories are dreams, duels, labyrinths, mirrors, infinite libraries, the manipulations of chance, knife fighters, tigers, and the elusive nature of identity itself. Um, it also says it explores a lot of sub-literary genres, which I just love. I have no expectations for this, but I think it's just going to be amazing, dreamlike, trance-like, and I'm excited to get into it. So that is Collected Fictions. I will really quickly mention this book because I've already read it, but surprise, I got it in the Penguin English Library edition. It is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I've read this. I read this what is this? Is this attached to my head? Yes. I read this in high school. I think I might have read it twice in high school, but um, I wanted to get the Penguin English Library edition and mark it up and just really get into it. It's a book that I think every time you come back to it, it's just going to hold something new for you and that's going to be 100% true for me. There's a really cool debate I watched recently which really inspired me to read it basically as soon as possible. It is um, Austin versus Bronte? Yeah. Yeah. So that was really cool and I cannot wait to kind of descend into the darkness that Wuthering Heights occupies and creates. Really quickly, another sci-fi that really made me happy reading it was Gemina by J. Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. This is a young adult sci-fi series. This is the second book in the Illuminae Files and I loved it. Basically four and a half stars, audiobook production. I always rave about it. You have to read this with the audiobook. It's multimedia format if you've never heard of it. Uh, it's all set in space. I always talk about it like it's Die Hard, which it kind of is, but also better than Die Hard and I loved it loved it. We have a book that I want to mention like literally for five seconds which is Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo. This was the Dark Academics book of the month for June. Hated it. Gave it two and a half stars. Did not like it at all. I'm so glad that this is over but um, yes this is a dark academia. I'm gonna use that term and phrase and subgenre very loosely. Extremely loosely. It's more of a supernatural trashy thriller uh, and that's all I'm gonna say. That was my house. To keep going with the spooky, I was also gifted The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole by Rose. Again, thank you so much. Um, this is another gothic story. So creepy, so spooky. Can't wait and get into all of the gothicness and annotate this as well. Um, this is on my July TBR as well, so this is another book I kind of want to try and get to. It's obviously pretty tiny, and um, yes, The Castle of Otranto. Apparently, I ordered a lot of really dark, spooky books as well, which I don't really know what that says, but I got Dracula by Bram Stoker in the Penguin English Library editions as well. I've already read Dracula, but the copy I have is crumbling and molding and falling apart because, um, I don't know, maybe the story is eating it from the inside out or something, but this is a really nice edition, obviously, and I also want to annotate all of these. I love how floppy they all are, and yes. The very last book I got sent to me uh, was sent from Ren over at Revel Reads. I'm currently in the middle of this, and I am loving it too much. I'm putting too much love into it. It is Autobiography of Red by Anne Carson. I am insanely obsessed with this. This is the last book of this haul and it is amazing. You guys know Anne Carson is one of my favorite writers ever, ever, ever. I wish I could be one fraction of intelligence um, as she is. She is intelligence. Uh, this is an autobiography but it's also a novel in verse. It reinvents everything. 
it is about the tenth labor of Heracles, uh, and it is a romance or a love story. It is heartbreaking. It is fresh it is new the way of looking at the world and the way of looking at the world through language and words and writing masterful masterpiece insanity obsessed with this love all right those are finally all of the books i got in quarantine uh so far at least maybe there'll be part two I really hope there's not going to be part two there might be a part two all right my camera died but thank you guys so much for watching i hope you enjoyed if you've read any of them and i don't know i just want to read all of them immediately i feel like they're all really gonna like become some of my favorite books so i hope you guys are keeping well and happy and i will see you very soon ciao